It's our joy this morning to have our friend, Father Sergius, abbot of St. Tegon's Monastery in Pennsylvania, as our testimony. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is in our midst. It's a wonderful blessing to be with you this morning, to, to be with Father, and, and with Matushka, Curry, and Martha, and with all of you. I am uh, Father Sergius. I'm the abbot of St. Tegon's Monastery, which is the oldest Orthodox monastery in America, founded by St. Tegon of Moscow in 1905. We have five Canaanite saints that have lived and have walked and have been at the monastery. Uh, and we continue that mission of St. Tegon of Moscow even to the present day with his blessing. Daily liturgy has served there for the past 115 years or so. And we really strive to make uh, our work, uh, you know, we have an impact on the rest of the church. So we continue to pray for you and for the entire church in America, that we all be strengthened in our faith and in our hope and our love for the Lord. And that God will give us that great strength and courage to continue through the struggles of our lives to find salvation. Today we have the wonderful opportunity to bring this icon to you of St. Anna. St. Anna was a mercy screaming icon for five years. You can uh, still smell, sometimes stronger, sometimes less, the, uh, that myrrh presence in the icon. Five years of weeping from 2004 to 2009, she began weeping myrrh on uh, Mother's Day. And of course, St. Anna is the mother of the mother of God. So she's Jesus' grandmother. And to the side of the icon, you see the relics of St. Anna, St. Joachim, and a little piece of the belt of the Mother of God. Fortunately, this Sunday is the Sunday of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And of course, what did the Seventh Ecumenical Council commemorate? But the icons. So today, St. Anna's here, a miracle-working icon. If, uh, if there's anything I know about this icon, it's a very special icon, and that it's a miracle-working icon. Many, many, many miracles have happened through this icon, especially for women who couldn't have children. They asked St. Anna for her intercessions, and through this icon, through the intercession of St. Anna, they received children. I've baptized some of them. I visited many of them. Uh, I've seen them. I've touched them. I've held them. It's been a wonderful, amazing occurrence through the blessing of St. Anna. And also various forms of cancer and paralysis and all sorts of things. Oftentimes people that have uh, healings give different things to the icon to St. Anna. And uh, a lot of jewelry is at home. Uh, so she has a big pile of jewelry of all those people and all those miracles and all of those thank offerings to her through the intercessions of this icon. So I urge you to, to take advantage of that. There is a, there's a certain grace that comes with this icon which I can't explain, but that's absolutely true and real and present with us today. The Seventh Day Ecumenical Council is also commemorated on one day. Sunday of Orthodoxy, right? After we've been fasting and praying that first week of Great Lent, on the Sunday of Orthodoxy, we commemorate the triumph of icons. And in a way, it seems maybe a bit strange to the logical mind. It says, well, we've been denying ourselves our, all week, and now we're affirming matter. I thought there was a problem with this world. The reality is, is that the icon reminds us that this world is good. And it's through this world, especially after the Incarnation, that God communicates His life, His grace, and His mercy to us in a very special and concrete way. <coughs> the icon reminds us that it is in this world today, through my life and through my world, that I'm going to encounter God and not anywhere, er, not anywhere else. There's no other place except my life, my world, my stuff, today. The icon affirms that at the most basic level, and so that first week of Great Lent after we fast and seemingly deny the world, the church brings before us again the world. And it reminds us that not only is the world good, but it's the vessel through which God conveys His grace to us. We see this most perfectly in the Eucharist, which we will be celebrating and commemorating. You know, we're in the process of moving towards the Anaphora and the Eucharist. 
receiving the very body and blood of Jesus Christ through this world. This world becomes, for us, communion and union with God our Savior. Everything in the church reminds us of this incarnational reality that through this world, God communicates to us His grace, a grace which we could not receive any other way. Sometimes in our culture, we tend to think that it's like matter is somehow suspect. Something's not right in this world. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's my stuff. Maybe it's this world. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's my soul. Something's not right. And so I'm going to blame everything else. But the reality is, especially the creation, because in that kind of framework, the creation is suspect, right? Something's wrong. I think it's the creation. But the reality is, is that as St. Isaac says, and also the scriptures tell us, it says, St. Isaac says, when I say the world, and not to love the world, he says, I don't mean the created world, he said, I mean the passions, lust, envy, pride, jealousy. He says, when I say the world, I'm not talking about matter, I'm talking about the passions. And so, love not the passions. And even St. John in his epistle, he says this. He says, love not the world. He says, that is to say, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So there's nothing wrong with the creation. The problem is with the passions. The passions which lurk inside of us and oftentimes take control of us. But the icon is the revelation that this world is not only good, and that this world is not only redeemed in Christ, not only on Golgotha, not only in the tomb, not only in Jerusalem, but here in this church. The world, the matter of this world is being redeemed. It is being the means through which God is connecting to us. Our own life, our own world is the means by which God speaks most clearly to us. It could be our wife, it could be our husband, it could be a neighbor, it could be our priest, it could be the church. But God is speaking to us, and the question for all of us is, are we going to listen? Yes. <laughs> I've been training, been training them. <laughs> I guess I, that was an amen. <laughs> we heard in the gospel today, they had the story of the sower who went out to sow the seeds. And you know... In, in the classic patristic understanding, Christ is the one who sows the seeds. He goes out into this world and he's tossing out these seeds everywhere, in every place and at all times, no matter whether we're in the church or outside of the church, God is present in this world. It is through this world that we are going to find God. It's nowhere else. It's either today or never. And so Christ goes out to sow the seeds, and he sows them. And some fell among good hearts. Some fell among not so good hearts. Some people were too busy. Some people were too concerned about their stuff. Some people were, were too upset. Some people, it has all of these different kinds of ground, quote unquote, of hearts, different kinds of hearts in which the seed was sown. Some were receptive and some were not. Some grew in those hearts. And as it says, they bore fruit with patience. So the question is, what kind of heart do we have? Are we working on purifying our heart of the bad stuff? And indeed, St. The uh, Theophon says, the principal asceticism of all Orthodox Christians is to keep the mind and the heart from passionate movement and thought. The principal asceticism of our work as Orthodox Christians, is to keep our mind and our heart from passionate movement and thought, from the bad stuff. Thinking bad, and about thinking about doing bad things, and about actually doing them, you know, we're all kind of guilty in some way, of thinking bad things, could be anything. But the reality is, is that we are supposed to, through our life of prayer, and through our life of repentance, strive to cleanse those things and prepare the heart so that that seed can grow inside of us, which is God's own word, God's own life, his, his own presence in this world. It can grow in us, and this heart can become a, a marvelous garden, full of beautiful flowers, and can become paradise once again. The only place I'm going to find paradise is right here, 
But concurrently, the only place that I might find hell is also right here as well. So the question is, is what is in our hearts? How to work to cleanse the heart, to purify the heart, to make it available. And so, for us, the icon today comes bringing and bears grace to us. And so, we must open our hearts to this grace that's in the church, whether it's in the Eucharist, whether it's in confession, or whether it's through the miraculous things that are in our church. There is grace that is constantly being conveyed to us. All we have to do is open our hearts, to ready our hearts. And how do we ready our hearts? Humble prayer to God is the easiest way to lower that vessel so that it can go into the well of grace and receive the water of life. Unless the vessel is lowered, it can't be filled. And in the same way for us, unless we lower our hearts before God in humility, we cannot be filled with these good things that are present with us today, or even in our own life. Father Zechariah says that in our own way, we serve liturgy every day through our thankfulness to God. The more thankful that we are for God, for His gifts and for His benefits, for His church, for His saints, and for the good things that He has done to us, He says, in some small way, we are serving liturgy at our heart through this thanksgiving. That body stove, what are we doing here? The Eucharist, it comes from that word in Greek, thank you. Eucharist, that body stove, it comes from the same word. So today we are giving thanks that somehow through this thanksgiving in the church, this world is becoming a place of communion for us today. It gives us a model of how to live our lives. The more thankful we are, the more God will give to us. And I always have a saying, you know, we may be suffering, we may be under duress, we may be afflicted, but thank God anyways. People may be unkind to us and our lives may be difficult, but thank God anyways. We may have cancer, we may have health problems, we may be dying, but thank God anyways. It won't hurt you, it will only help you. And as St. Barsinupia says, Thanksgiving intercedes for our weaknesses before God, our shortcomings. So the things that we haven't done, the things that we might have failed to do, that Thanksgiving will make up for those shortcomings and for our mistakes, for our sins before God. The more thankful we are to God, the more that we will receive. Let us not think that somehow spiritual life is somewhere in the future. And that heaven is somewhere, a place that I don't even know where it's at. It's somewhere over there. Let us not somehow be mistaken in our, our thought process about that. Spiritual life is today. God is here today. His grace is present today. And here in the heaven of the heart, if we lower it with a humble prayer like, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. This humble prayer before God will work miracles in the paradise of our heart. That grace can flow in freely. That life of the church which is conveyed to us through the world, the created world through the incarnation comes to us today. Let us humble ourselves with that contrite and humble prayer before God, giving thanks for everything, as St. Paul says, because this is the will of God concerning us in Christ Jesus. And I'll leave you with a thought from St. John of Damascus. He says, I don't venerate matter, he says, I venerate the creator of matter, who became matter, and who through matter accomplished my salvation. I cease not to venerate the matter through which my salvation was accomplished. The icon reminds us that God is present in, with us today. As it says in the epistle, God was manifest in the flesh, seen of angels, preached among the Gentiles, justified in the spirit, and received up into glory. The icon is the confirmation of the incarnation. And it makes that grace and that life of God present to us today. Let us humbly receive it with thanksgiving, giving joy, giving thanks, giving gratitude to our God, to whom you have glory, honor, and worship, now and forever, world without end. Amen. Amen.